I know I'm late to this, but I promise I have a semi-good reason. As many of you have heard, and you know, the reason why you clicked on this video is because Netflix came out with a live-action adaptation to one of the most prolific, long-running anime of all time. That, of course, is One Piece. One Piece, if you didn't know, released its first manga volume in 97 and has been on air since 99. And at the time of recording this video, we're almost at 1,080 episodes. Now, as many of you know, animated series have a particularly terrible, horrible, no good, very bad reputation when it comes to getting its own live action adaptation. I've actually already made a video about one of these on the channel before, Death Note, which also was by Netflix. But not only have I seen that, but I also watched the entirety of Dragon Ball Evolution and Avatar The Last Airbender. And, uh, I'm somewhere between 90 and 94% sure that I cursed myself and by extension my entire family for having consumed all of it into my eyes. If you want to see reviews on both of those, I just leave a comment. Spoiler alert! They're kind of stinky. They're, they're no good. Boo. Boo. So, that being said, everyone, including myself, was quite apprehensive about this. But lo and behold, this show has been getting a lot of praise. A lot more praise than a lot of shows nowadays. In fact, it has so much praise that I, a born-again weeb of nearly ten years, actually sat down and committed to watch the entirety of the East Blue Arc from the One Piece anime. And, hold your applause, it was also in sub. <laughs> I can't believe I genuinely like One Piece now. And I don't, I can't believe that I still want to watch more of it. What have I become? What I love about One Piece is the characters. The fight scenes so far are kind of okay. And I mean, to be fair, we've really been blessed with great fight choreography, thanks to Marvel, Star Wars, Demon Slayer, Jujutsu Kaisen, and a whole lot more. So, I don't want to be too harsh on this show from 25 years ago. But also, the show's incredibly drawn out. I mean, obviously, but even in the first season, it's really drawn out. But even then... I still love this show because of the characters. It was like the manga writer Ich Ichiro Oda. Oda, hold on. Ichiro Oda. It's like Ichiro Oda was like, I don't know how to write a story. I don't know how to write choreography. I don't know how to chop off the good bits. But you know what I do know how to do? I know how to write a character backstory. <laughs> Monkey D. Luffy wants to find the One Piece and become King of the Pirates as a promise that he made to an old friend and idol, you could say. Sanji wants to find the All Blue, a single place where fish from all four seas can supposedly be found. Nami wants to chart a map of the entire world, not only for herself, but also to make her sister, her home village, and her late mother proud. Usopp wants to become a brave warrior of the seas in a sharpshooter like his dad before him. And Roranora Zoro wants to become the greatest swordsman as a promise that he made to his closest friend who died at a young age, but also to carry on her legacy. And if that didn't convince you at all, I promise that a one-sentence synopsis does not do an entire episode or two justice. So, to say that Netflix had some pretty big shoes to fill would be an understatement. So... Now that I've given you some lore, some backstory, what do I think? I... I really liked it. Do I think it was as good as the anime? No, it, it wasn't overall. But this is an adaptation, to be fair. It's not supposed to be a one-to-one -one recreation, but at the same time, it is supposed to be faithful to the source material, unlike some other things. Because there, there are some things that you can't do in live action that you can get away with in animation, such as breaking physics, having an incredibly annoying, bubbly, and yet somehow endearing character, or the horniness levels of Master Roshi, which Dragon Ball Evolution kept in the movie. Don't do that. Let that be a lesson to you. Don't do that. So what are some things that they got right? First of all, 
the set pieces and use of practical effects. I love seeing that. It just reminds me of the shows that I watched, the movies that I watched as a kid. And it's just so much better to see an actual set, an actual explosions, as opposed to just an entire green screen where you just see layers of CGI compositing that just feel effortless and that the director's had more of a mindset of we'll do it in post as opposed to let's do as best as we can throughout the entire stage of production. I mean, the ships were all built. It reminded me of Hook from 91, I believe, with Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. I, I just loved to see that, and it really, it really did add to the atmosphere. Something the show actually built upon and made better were the fight scenes. Like I said before, the fight scenes, at least in the East Blue arc, left a bit to be desired, in my opinion. They were really drawn out throughout multiple episodes, without much choreography in between. And then, Luffy gets the Superman-Goku treatment, where these are OP characters who have to be removed from the fight from one reason or another, so that there can be actual stakes when the other characters are fighting, so that the fight isn't, you know two seconds because Luffy does some gum gum attack and then wins. So when I saw that this show was just filled with fights and just sword fights and choreography and some actual little just battle tactics, uh, I, I was really hyped to say the least. Uh, the adaptation knew exactly what its strengths were going to be going into it that being like actual fight scenes and i it, it was beautiful it was beautiful shift kiss i want to see more i still want to see more though something else that i would be remiss to add to this section would be the villains the villains were were really good in the show but in netflix's adaptation they were even better except for like maybe arlong arlong i think i think the actor was just trying too hard to have a low voice cuz Something I talked about, I believe I talked about in a low voice, uh, voice acting thing is sometimes you have a guy who's trying to do this all the time, but the thing is, when you're this low, you can't emote. You can only talk this low, and it doesn't sound good. So then when you have to actually emote, you're actually up here. It's just like, eh, what? So that was just a tiny thing, but every other pirate, especially Buggy, especially Buggy the Cloud, he was done so good. I love him. I don't know if any cast or crew are going to stumble upon this video, but if you see this, please, we need more Buggy. We need like twice as much Buggy. He was amazing. It was beautiful. So a few things that I didn't care for are going to be some nitpicks, especially really only if you've already seen One Piece. The backstories in the Netflix show were not as good as the anime, which I get that these episodes are 40 minutes to an hour and you can't spend that entire 40 to an hour doing a backstory. And I should say that I watched this with my roommate and he seemed to think that they were all good. So again, this is probably just a if you've already seen the anime thing. <laughs> Hey, in three words or less, how did you ex how would you explain One Piece? Long. Was it good? The live action, yeah. Cool. Really, the only two that stick out the most would be Nami and Zoro. I don't want to get into spoilers, so I'll just say it would be it would have been better, in my opinion, if n the village knew about Nami like they do in the anime. And when it comes to Zoro, the real issue is his relationship with Kuina was not built well. It didn't make a whole lot of sense for Zoro to devote his life to becoming the greatest swordsman for this girl who was on screen for five minutes, maybe. In the anime, he loses to Kuina 2,002 times, I believe, to zero. He does not win a single one. That Losing over and over again really added to how much Zoro is dedicating himself to be better than this one person who keeps besting him, which is also a theme that you see throughout the anime. But something else I will say 
is they did not do Kuina dirty like they did in <laughs> in the anime. Let's just say they didn't make her allergic to stairs. <laughs> and then there was one tiny nitpick that I would have done that I wouldn't do. And this is just something that I've seen in multiple shows. In the third episode of Netflix's One Piece, the character Clahador is a captain of the Black Cat Pirates. And he has this ability called Stealth Foot, which allows him to move incredibly fast and quiet. And then they show that on screen. They show him moving like a cheap CW flash, just blur and move fast towards a, one of our heroes, and it really brings you out of the moment. I wouldn't have done that. What I would have much rather seen is just see him appear and then back off, and then the same second he just appears, he just, uh, he just appears from there and then back off and that, that sort of thing. Or, you know, the, the episode has this really cool haunted house horror theme to it, which I really liked. What's even more scary, especially for the characters and for things that we can relate to, is just having Clahador just appear very briefly behind some object and then go behind it. And that's the kind of thing that you only see out of your peripheral. You go, oh, did I see that? D did I see that? No, it was just my imagination. Oh, no, no, there was nothing there. It's, it's that sort of tension that like, you know there's something there, but you can't see it. Or maybe there's nothing there at all that is much scarier than seeing a blur effect. Which is something that I learned from Supernatural. Whenever the angels appear, or whenever they leave, they just play the sound effect of them leaving. But you don't actually see them leave, because if you did, it would probably detract from all of the realism, and it leaves more to the imagination. And leaving more to the imagination by not showing anything, kind of like Jaws, never showing the shark until the end, is much more interesting than just having it on screen all the time. If you want to call me, just call, just call me. No, I'll make the show even better, don't worry about it. I have exactly one experience. If you count YouTube. And corporate videos. I'm getting on ta I'm getting on tangent. Then the last thing I really didn't care for was the level of animated. Some of the characters were mostly Luffy. Uh, me no good with words, but hopefully good example here. Luffy in the anime, as most shonen protagonists are, is a very loud, energetic, happy-go-lucky, one-track-minded kind of guy. He's a real 10 out of 10 on the Red Bull national scale. Inyaki Godoy, I don't know if that's how you, how, you how you pronounce the name of him. I'm so sorry. I mean, it's not even close. But uh, he's the live-action actor for Luffy, and I think he, he does a good job with what he's given. I think the issue is with the directorial decision to turn down the dial to like a 5 out of 10 with his ADHD tendencies. And I would have much rather seen something closer to like a 7 out of 10 goofy goober that would contrast amazingly with the serious, pissed off version of Luffy. Now, I don't know if they tried this and it just came across as too cringy. Just like Master Roshi from Dragon Ball Evolution, he just stayed crazy from the anime, and it did not translate. It was very, very hard to sit through. But Luffy and a lot of other characters right now are in this weird zone where they feel like they're the average college student running on two hours of sleep and like two pots of death wish, as opposed to someone who's incredibly friendly and extroverted, arguably to a fault. So I guess the bottom line that I'm trying to get to is it would be really nice to see them dial everyone up just a little bit to keep the jovialness of the source material, make Luffy the kind of guy who gives everybody a side hug too instead of just being happy in the face all the time, or conversely, dial it down a little more and kind of make it a bit more of your own thing. Like I said, the source material is very happy. I don't think anyone in the manga even dies. I don't think there's like a single death other than like Old Roger. I could be wrong, that's just something I've heard. But if you dialed it down more, you could get much more of a gritty pirate feel 
which would also be fun for another demographic to build upon and make it your own. So do I recommend this show? Yes-ish. <laughs> uh, if you've been wanting to watch One Piece, but you don't want to commit to the thousand plus episodes, this is a faithful recreation without being a one-to-one -one recreation. As it stands, it still has enough anime-isms, though, to be cringy if that's not the kind of thing you're into. If I had to make kind of like an analogy, I'd say it's somewhere between, like, Supernatural seasons three to eight and Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales. Just somewhere, somewhere between there. All in all, I'm very excited for season two, which has been confirmed. I'm going to watch the entirety of the Alabasta arc before that, but... Season 2 is not going to come out till 2025, if, if I had to guess. So, I have a bit of time, but unfortunately, you do not. There is a bomb placed in your computer right now, which can read whether or not you click the like button, subscribe, and comment, LOL, so wholesome. So that this video and my channel will be promoted throughout the YouTube algorithm. So if you do that, you will be spared. But if not, you have exactly 20 seconds. So thanks for coming along on this journey with me. I hope that you decide to give One Piece a try, and if you what you thought about it, leave a comment after leaving LOL So Wholesome. I'm not depressed, I swear. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.